All right, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how muscles work. Muscles are extremely important for exercise physiology. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that you use your muscles often when you're exercising. Um, they are very important parts of our physiology. They allow us to interact with the world and do many of the tasks that we do in our everyday life. You'll also see through this lecture that they play a lot of important roles that you might not necessarily think of as well. And their actual function and structure is a lot different than this kind of macro scale that we have on this original lecture slide. All right, let's uh, now discuss the three different types of muscle that we have in the human body. The first of which is cardiac muscle. As you can probably guess from the image as well as the name uh, cardiac muscle, this type of muscle only occurs in the heart. Cardiac muscle uh, is involuntary, which means in an essence, it can control itself with some fine tuning by the nervous and endocrine system. Um, we will discuss cardiac muscle a little bit more in maybe another video. Um, we're gonna predominantly focus on skeletal muscle in terms of this actual video. So the next type of muscle we have is smooth muscle, um, which is also involuntary because it is not under the direct conscious control. It's found in the walls of most of the blood vessels where its contraction and relaxation lead to vessel constriction and dilation respectively. And this allows um, this type of muscle to regulate blood flow. It is also found in the walls of digestive organs, um, which allows it to contract and relax to help move food down the digestive tract. Uh, these, again, are very important components of your body and very important muscles. However, we're not going to really focus specifically on them in terms of this video. So lastly, we have skeletal muscle, which is in fact under conscious control. If you think about your biceps or your body in general, um, anytime you want to move yourself or move your body, you have to think and consciously control that action. Um, together with the bones of the skeleton, uh, they make up the musculoskeletal system. Um, these muscles have um, found their way into our everyday vocabulary. If you think about uh, biceps, um, trapezius, uh, deltoids, a lot of these kind of names are things that we think of and we use in our everyday nomenclature. Um, exercise requires movement of the body and this is predominantly accomplished through skeletal muscle. So we're going to focus on skeletal muscle for the rest of this video, um, and that is kind of going to be the focus of the next few slides. So let's first talk a little bit about the anatomy of skeletal muscle. Uh, this is a cross section of an individual skeletal muscle. So think about, uh, for example, your bicep. As you can see, uh, we have a tendon that's attached to the bone. Um, this is not actual muscle, it's connective tissue, uh, but it allows the muscle to interact with the bone, cause torque and leverage. Within the actual muscle, we have a connective tissue uh, outer layer called the epimysium. Um, and then we have the um, actual you know, muscle body itself, which is covered by the epimysium. Then we have the paramysium, which is the connective tissue that surrounds each individual fascicle. Uh, that muscle body is composed of multiple fascicles. Um, and then each fascicle has its own connective tissue. Um, and within each fascicle, there are numerous muscle fibers. So if you think about it, it's kind of a layer within a layer within a layer. So your individual bicep muscle has many components to it, um, many fascicles within that individual uh, muscle. Um, and within each fascicle, you have many muscle fibers. Um, another kind of point to make about muscle is that we have 600 plus skeletal muscles in the body and that muscle uh, fibers are actually multinucleated cells. Um, most cells have a single neuron, however, muscle fibers actually have multiple nucleuses. So now we're going to look into each individual uh, muscle fiber. So again, we had uh, that whole uh, muscle body, then we had individual fascicles within that muscle body, and within each uh, 
fascicle, we had multiple muscle fibers. So as you can see here, this um, itself is a single one of those muscle fibers. And within the muscle fiber, we actually have yet another kind of uh, smaller layer. We have these myofibrils, um, which there are numerous myofibrils within each muscle fiber. And as you can see here, uh, this is the level at which we have things like uh, mitochondria, um, the connective tissue around the muscle fiber is the sarcolemma, um, and we also have kind of this extra uh, cellular fluid that the mitochondria kind of reside within and that the myofibrils reside within. Um, within each myofibril, we then have uh, these sarcomeres. So a myofibril is composed of multiple sarcomeres. So this itself from here to here is a sarcomere. And these individual sarcomeres are actually the smallest contractile unit of a muscle. And that's something that may you know, show up on an exam if you're in kind of an anatomy and physiology um, course, or it may be important for your exercise physiology course. So we'll get into a little, a little bit more, um, but essentially uh, the contractile unit, what happens is, is that uh, this green section will actually get pulled closer to this uh, red layer in between. But essentially, just kind of a point of reference, we have these sarcomeres, which are the smallest individual um, kind of contractile units of the muscle. Uh, these are kind of connected to each other and make a myofibril right here. And within the myofibril, we again have the muscle fiber. And within the muscle fiber, you have, or the muscle fiber makes up uh, the, uh, the actual fascicle itself, and then uh, numerous fascicles make up the muscle body. Another thing uh, that we'll talk a tiny bit about later is this sarcoplasmic reticulum. Essentially, this kind of uh, area will release a chemical that will allow these units here to contract and um, cause this green stuff to go this direction towards the center, making the whole kind of sarcomere length shorter. So now we have uh, the actual sarcomere. So this is comprised of myosin and actin. And kind of like what I was talking about earlier, you have these little heads on myosin that will actually connect here to actin and we'll pull it um, and we'll pull it in that direction so that this area gets closer and what that does is here as you can see it makes the sarcomere skinnier um, and if you think about that if you have uh, one of these um, sarcomeres and then you have say another sarcomere and each of the sarcomeres is getting uh, shorter and getting closer together, that will cause the whole cell muscle to contract, um, which is a s contracting in a similar manner to what you might see um, with like a bicep curl, for example. But uh, let's talk a little bit about how we get from the whole muscle level all the way down to this myosin and actin uh, contraction within the sarcomere. All right, so now is kind of the final part of this section. We're going to talk a little bit about how the brain signals um, to the muscle to contract and how that process kind of plays out. Um, so as you can see here, we have an action potential that comes along a neuron, um, and this is actually called an alpha neuron. And what this neuron does is it innervates uh, the muscle at a region called the neuromuscular junction, so right here. And this is kind of a screened in or a kind of close up view of this neuromuscular junction. And as you can see here, there is some acetylcholine right here uh, that is released into the neuromuscular junction and that causes uh, and attaches to these receptors. 
Um, and what these receptors do is they open sodium ion channels that lead to excitation and a uh, action potential down the T-tubule. Um, and this T-tubule will interact with the neuromuscular junction within the cell. That was kind of that yellow stuff we talked about in the last slide. And what that neuromuscular junction, or I mean, uh, endoplasmic reticulum does is it releases calcium into that environment right here. And that calcium will um, essentially remove or remove this kind of blocking factor on the um, actin and allow the myosin and actin to bind. And so when the thin and thick filament, the thick filament is the myosin and thin filament is the actin, interact, it causes again that shortening, that shortening of the sarcomeres together. Um, and that causes a muscle contraction right here. So you can see, so we have these individual myofibrils, uh, they shorten and contract with all the different sarcomeres contracting, and this causes the fascicles to contract, and in essence, this causes the entire muscle to shorten, and this produces tension and movement. Um, and the importance of that movement is the fact that the muscle shortening is connected to connective tissue, um, and that connective tissue and tendon is connected to a bone. So essentially our movement, our muscle contraction is the movement of two bones together. So every muscle has an insertion and an origin. It is essentially attached to two different bones. And what that muscle is doing is either bringing those two bones closer together. So if you think of a bicep curl, you're bringing uh, the bones in your forearm to the, or the bones in your upper arm. So you're bringing them closer together. And then if you relax, you will have the two bones get farther apart. The angle between those two bones farther apart. So that is essentially uh, signaling uh, for muscle contraction. So I think this is kind of a, a good overview, something that can kind of help you understand what is going on at a kind of more molecular level with muscle contractions. We'll kind of get into muscle contractions and how it changes with exercise in later videos. Uh, but I think this is useful in terms of uh, everyone having a good physiological and anatomical understanding of uh, this background. And this will help you understand more of what we have uh, or more of what I'll go over in future videos.